Uh, tonight, I want to talk about what is sometimes referred to as church hurt, and I want to begin with a definition. Church hurt is the emotional and psychological pain experienced as a result of negative experiences with a religious community, congregation, or an individual of that congregation. It stems from situations where individuals feel betrayed, rejected, judged, or mistreated by fellow church members or leaders. This type of hurt can result in feelings of isolation, loss of faith, and disillusionment. It may also lead to individuals questioning their beliefs and relationship with God. Church hurt can, due to various reasons such as conflicts with, uh, within the church, abuses of power, hypocrisy, or exclusionary attitudes. Now, if we look at church history, if we look at the early church like we will tonight, and if we even look to our own experiences, we have probably seen and maybe experienced examples of this in some way or form. And in light of this issue, I want us to devote some time to understanding this problem. We'll first begin by considering some uh, examples, uh, examples in the past and today of, of church hurt. And finally, we'll consider what we can do as individuals to recover from, from such pain and to prevent such problems in the church to begin with. So let's begin by just considering a few examples. When we read the New Testament, we find uh, even from the most godly and mature of people, we find that they often struggled with conflict, or at least sometimes struggled with conflict with their brethren. We'll consider two examples, the first in Philippians chapter 4, and then the next in Acts chapter 15. We look at the book of Philippians, and in Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 through 3, Paul writes, I entreat you, Odia and Syntyche, to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, as you read the book of Philippians, you find one of the things that is consistently emphasized chapter after chapter is the importance of unity and agreement with each other in Christ, which may suggest to us that this is something that the Philippians struggle to achieve, at least in the case of Euodia and Syntyche. Now, as he writes, we see that these are both very godly women. He describes them as having their names written in the book of life and as active Christians, those who had even worked along with him. And, reg and even though they were godly and mature women, they still had this struggle in their relationship with each other. We don't know the details of it, but we can imagine that it caused a great deal of hurt and pain, something that Paul also knew well from his own experience, unfortunately. If you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 41. Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 41. And, some days, uh, and after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we have proclaimed the word of the Lord, and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with, with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. There arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him <clears throat> and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commanded, uh, having been commended by the brothers uh, to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and uh, 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 Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So we see, of course, Paul and Barnabas had already gone on one missionary journey together where they had traveled to different cities and planted various churches, and they felt it would be good and wise to go and, and visit these churches to see how they were doing and how they could be of service. And as they were uh, preparing to go on the second missionary journey, we see that Barnabas wanted to bring along John Mark. As we see in verse 38, he had kind of went on the first one, but as, he was making, as they were making their way through, he gave up and turned back. We're not told exactly the reason why. We just know that he had turned back at, at some point in the journey. Now, Barnabas wanted to give him another chance, but Paul did not want to. And when you read the book of Luke, sometimes he's trying to teach a particular lesson, and he'll write in such a way to indicate when something is clearly wrong or right, but he doesn't do that here. He kind of leaves it open. He doesn't indicate who was wrong or right. And we, we can imagine that Barnabas had good reasons for 
uh, wanting to take John Mark along with him. He probably thought to himself, well, Christianity is about second chances. Let's give him another chance to, to prove his worth. Paul perhaps felt from his perspective that this mission was too crucial and too important and that maybe they couldn't trust someone who had proven themselves unable to do the task before. And again, Luke does not indicate who was right or wrong, but he does indicate that there was a sharp contention between the two, so much so that they could not do the work together. God only knows the pain that they felt because of this disagreement and how many uh, sleepless nights it probably caused. And I think it's, it's important when we look at passages in Philippians chapter 4 and Luke chapter 15 uh, that sometimes when brethren have disagreements with each other, there's not always a cut and dry answer of who's more right or, more, or who's more wrong. Sometimes it doesn't even have to do with, with sin or someone doing the wrong thing, but on deciding what is best. And those are very difficult situations. But regardless of how a person might experience church hurt or be hurt by their brethren, this can cause a great deal of pain, even to the point where, where people leave. And uh, for those who have been in the church a long time and see pe seen people who have been hurt by their brethren or have experienced this themselves, they often note that this particular pain seems to cut much deeper than other kinds of pain. But why is this? Well, think of a stranger, for example, or think of a particular time where you were in public or maybe driving down the road and a stranger cut you off or did something to bother you. Don't think about it too long, just for a moment. Uh, we don't want to get too upset here, but we've probably had times in our life where a stranger has hurt our feelings in some way, and maybe it's even ruined our day. But we go on and we forget about it because at the end of the day, that person's a stranger. They're not really a part of our lives. But when it has to do with something like family, a family where hopefully we are able to find a great deal of joy, peace, and security, when we're hurt by our family, it's a little bit different. Uh, often those feelings cut much deeper than being offended or hurt by any stranger would. And because our family is supposed to be a, a place of security, when we don't have that, it does hurt us in a very deep way. And I believe this can put in perspective why being hurt by brethren uh, can hurt so deeply because they are family to us and arguably even closer because of what we share in Christ. And not only this, but uh, for good reason, we have high standards for our brethren. We all come together to try and conform to the image of the Son of God as we grow and mature. And when one fails to do so, it only magnifies the pain that we feel. And people react to this kind of pain in various kinds of ways. Some people are in a very healthy way are able to compartmentalize the pain that they feel. A, a, a person might be hurt by a brother in Christ, but say to themselves, well, I have this negative feeling towards this one brother, but that doesn't affect how I see the church. It doesn't affect how I see Christianity or my relationship with Christ. Uh, some, pe some people are able to compartmentalize in that very healthy way. Others struggle to do so. Uh, for, for some, unfortunately, when they have a negative experience with a brother or sister in Christ, it's sometimes difficult for them not to project those same negative emotions on the congregation or on their relationship with Christ as a whole. And I'm not saying this is good, but as I've gotten older, I've begun to understand this a little bit more. Sometimes when we have a bad experience in, in one area, that negative, those negative feelings can kind of seep over into something else. Uh, for example, uh, you know, me and my wife, we used to go to Waffle House. Now, I know some people really hate Waffle House. I like Waffle House. It's okay if you don't. Um, we haven't been there in five years, though, because last time we went, Cheryl got a kidney stone. Now, of course, that's not Waffle House's fault, but every time my wife thinks of Waffle House, she thinks of a kidney stone. Now, of course, that's not Waffle House's fault, but because she had that negative experience there, bled over into everything else. And so it's, it's on our to-do list to go back. We just haven't, you know, made time for that just yet. Uh, but unfortunately, people do this with church. You know, they have a negative experience at a particular congregation or with a brother. And even though it's not ideal or right, it's very easy for them to see everything else associated with Christianity in a negative way. And of course, this, is, <clears throat> this should be something that the individual uh, should try to overcome. However, it should be something that we are aware of so that we can try to prevent issues like this as best as possible. I think it's helpful to remind ourselves of what Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 19, where he says, A brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city. Now, you may think that's a little bit hyperbolic, but sometimes it doesn't feel that way. 
uh, he says sometimes that it's, it's easier to take a strong city than it is to make right with a brother who is angry with you. Uh, to put things in perspective, when Nebuchadnezzar tried to take Tyre, he laid siege to it for 13 years. And only after 13 years were, did they acquiesce and decide to pay tribute to him. And yet Solomon says sometimes that seems easier than trying to make things right with a brother who's offended. So let's uh, talk about, or let's begin by talking about some things that we can do to prevent, uh, to prevent a context where someone would get hurt. One of the first things I want us to consider is the, the differences that we have to learn to embrace. When we read the prophets, when we read the New Testament, and actually even when we read some of the Psalms, we find that one of the things that God has been trying to create from the very beginning in Christ is this community for his own possession. And when we read of the descriptions of the prophets in the New Testament of this particular community, we find that it is not filled with people who are alike, but people who are very different from one another. In fact, we see this very clearly as we begin to read Matthew chapter 10. When we look at Matthew chapter 10, we see the, uh, the specific apostles that Jesus called to himself. And some of these men are very different from each other. One of the first that he calls is Matthew, who is a, a tax collector and an agent of the Roman Empire. But he also selects Simon the Zealot, and this indicates to us that he's a revolutionary. He is one who believed that you ought to fight for the independence of Israel. And by the way, it wasn't uncommon for people in Simon's group to kill people who were in Matthew's group. Now, if you're trying to uh, launch this religious movement, and you may think to yourself, well, let's get some people who get along and you know, create a nice, healthy work environment. You may think at first, well, maybe Jesus had a different strategy. Jesus understood that what he was attempting to create in his blood and in his spirit would be something that would unite all people regardless of their differences. And this is one of the things that we find uh, in the church. When we look at the New Testament, we find that Christ brought people from all over the world together, regardless of how different they were. Uh, one of the things that I found one scholar point out the other day, uh, something that maybe I didn't really think about before, but for many people, when they came to church in the Roman Empire or, or converted to Christianity and came to church, that was perhaps one of the first times in their life or the only time in their life where they would come and sit at a table with people of different economic classes, of different classes of free or slave, of, of both Greeks and Jews, and they all treated each other as equal. And this is one of the things that Paul emphasizes in Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 through 28. He says, For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so though we are all, all, are all one, we still have many differences. Uh, anything from you know, our cultural background to our, our, our personal preferences. And this is something that you know, as we consider the community we are part of, we should expect these differences, embrace them, and emphasize what we share in Christ over everything else. And with this, we must also embrace humility. You can, if you will, you can turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And as uh, Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, uh, and as he's trying to help them create this more uh, harmonious environment, he writes in Philippians 2, beginning in verse 2, he says, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. And one of the things that we find emphasized in Paul's writings and, of course, in Jesus' teachings to his disciples is that one of the, the key virtues that every Christian has to master is humility. In fact, when we look at Matthew chapter 18, uh, we find a situation that is often repeated in the Gospels where we find a situation where the disciples are arguing who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And when, when Jesus would hear them have these discussions or these debates, he would then interject a, a radical example to help them recontextualize how they should think of greatness in the kingdom of heaven. 
He takes a little child, and in Matthew 18, verse 4, he says, Whoever humbles himself, like this child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And one of the best ways a church can prevent hurt feelings and encourage peace is by mastering this virtue. When Christians put each other first, and they are unified in love and consider what they desire last, there is virtually no avenue or path for hurt feelings or to inflict any kind of pain. And of course, with this, with, with emphasizing what we share in Christ above everything else, with mastering the virtue of humility, uh, a, a, another helpful thing is just to give each other the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I can't think of a particular verse that ties in with this. There might be some lessons in, in Joshua chapter 22. But at, at least in my experience, what I've often found is that when there is a problem or where, where there is an issue, at least half the time, if not the majority of time, there's often a misunderstanding, a misunderstanding into someone else's intentions, or, uh, or someone has acted in such a way that has offended someone unintentionally. And often, if we first give the benefit of the doubt, I think we would save ourselves a lot of trouble. But now I want us to uh, uh, take a moment and consider how churches can recover and how Christians can recover from church hurt. One of the, the most important things that we can do is we can confront issues as they arise. Uh, in my experience, what typically happens is that someone will get hurt or someone will get offended and then does nothing about it. I knew of one lady who uh, would attend a particular congregation for a while. Eventually, her feelings would get hurt and then she would go to another congregation. She stay there a while, and eventually her feelings would get hurt, and then she would go to another congregation, and the cycle would just repeat time and time again. Uh, it's not too difficult to do in places like Athens, Alabama, where there are 50 churches of Christ, but still, eventually, you do run out. Some people just move to another congregation, some have stopped attending altogether, and some just keep the pain to themselves and grow embittered. But none of these options are, are biblical or helpful or ideal in any way. As Jesus says in Matthew 18, verse 15, he says, If your brother sins against you, go and, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Now, I'm going to maybe make a wider op application from this verse. He is talking about sin, but as we noticed earlier with uh, Euodia and Syntyche, and with men like Paul and Barnabas, there's no evidence that a particular sin was committed, but there was a disagreement, there was a contention. I, I still think we can use this verse and make an application from it. Jesus says that when there's a problem that we have a responsibility of, upon ourselves uh, to go and try and make things right. Now, in my experience, most people, at least most Christians, do not do this. They just kind of keep the pain to themselves. And I think part of the reason that this, this happens so frequently is many people uh, forget the very thing that God is trying to, cre to create. What we find all throughout the scriptures is that God is in the process of making a community, a people for his own possession. When we look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus is clear. He says, I will build my ecclesia, you know, my community, my congregation, my assembly, or as we often translate it, my church. We, what people often tend to focus on is their individual relationship with God, but they often neglect the relationship they are obligated to have with their brethren. And because of this role and responsibility we are given, it is our responsibility to cultivate a, a harmony, uh, excuse me, a, a, an environment of harmony and peace. And when we sense that there is not any, it's our job to fix it. And as, as Jesus says, you know, when these things arise, we shouldn't put them off. We should try to deal with them as quickly as possible to, to prevent them from getting worse. And once they're resolved, we should extend grace and forgiveness. Uh, no relationship, family, or community can exist without grace. Uh, people hurt people. Uh, it is inevitable. You know, if you've been married long enough, no matter how perfect you are or how perfect your spouse is, you have, some of you are already laughing because you know, you will eventually hurt the other. And it's not because you're bad people, it's just because people are imperfect people. If you've been in a family long enough, you've hurt someone in your family, and your family has hurt you. 
And if you've been a Christian long enough, you have hurt one of your brothers or sisters in Christ, and a brother or sister in Christ has hurt you. That's why Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. We must always remember, as we are attempting to extend grace and forgiveness to our brethren, that we have always hurt God more than anyone has ever hurt us. And if God can extend his grace and forgiveness to us, we must be willing to extend that same level of grace and forgiveness to others. But finally, there's one other thing that, that must be considered. Now, ideally, and perhaps in most situations, this kind of pain can be prevented by Christians doing what they ought. And when such conflicts do arise, they can be resolved quickly by Christians doing what they ought to do. However, there are situations and there are times where there is a member who is problematic, who does cause pain and division and does not seek to repent. This is true today, and unfortunately this was common in the first century church. As Paul writes to Titus in, in Titus chapter 3, verses 10 through 11, he says, As for a person who stores up, or excuse me, stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and is sinful, he is self-condemned. Now notice what Paul says. If there's such a divisive person, you warn them. You know, as we've already acknowledged, you know, people aren't perfect. We all need to be warned. We all need to be rebuked and encouraged to do, to, to do better. Uh, we, we all need grace. But when it comes specifically to people who are divisive, Paul says you warn them once, then a second time, and then strike three, you're out. Now, one might think that this seems harsh, but we have to remember a few things. As we see in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 19, God hates it when people sow discord among their brethren because it destroys the very thing he's trying to, to build, a people for his own possession. And the sad fact is, is something that, that Peter learned in Mark chapter 8, verse 33, that even a Christian can become an agent and tool of Satan. Though in a slightly different context, we find in Mark chapter 8, when Jesus is telling Peter what his plan is for the cross, Peter says, this isn't going to happen to you. Immediately, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for your, th your mind is on the will of man and not the will of God. And unfortunately, when certain brethren begin to act more like Satan than Christ, they have no part in our community. Paul understood this to be true. Now, of course, while there might be a, a context or an avenue where they can repent and, and prove themselves worthy of repentance, Paul understood that because of what we're trying to build and the, even sometimes the fragility a, a community or a, a, a church can have, that such actions cannot be tolerated. Now, as we see in reference to church hurt, that when it comes to experiencing this pain, this is something we've all experienced. It's something that was even experienced in the early church. And it's not because of Christ. It's not because of Christianity. It's just the fact that, that we are imperfect people. And though we try our best, we will make mistakes. But by focusing on what we share in Christ, embracing the differences we have, exercising humility, grace, and forgiveness, we can prevent much of this pain. And when we act quickly to, to deal and resolve the differences we do have, uh, we can maintain the peace in our relationships. Now, as we've been uh, considering this particular topic tonight, if you're here tonight and maybe this is something you're struggling with, Maybe this is something you need to meditate on and, and pray about because maybe there's something you need to resolve with your brother or sister in Christ. But if there's anything we can do for you now, maybe you'd like us to pray about you or a particular situation, we'd love to go to God on your behalf. We know God is gracious and he will give you the strength and the wisdom to do what you need to do and allow us as your brethren to encourage you in any way that we can. If there's anything we can do for you now spiritually, please come forward as we stand and sing.